Bueno, vamos a empezar eh, esta segunda parte con la, con la intervención de Samir Yunes, que, que es arquitecto, que es profesor en la Universidad de Notre Dame. Eh, fue director de varios de sus programas y es un, es un arquitecto que, que ha estado siempre muy interesado por la, por la teoría de la arquitectura y ha escrito muchos libros muy interesantes sobre, sobre arquitectura tradicional, algunos de los cuales presentará después, eh, justo antes del descanso para la comida. Os dejo con él. Uh, good morning, everyone. We now, uh, we now have three thriving generations of traditional architects all over the world teaching and practicing traditional architecture. Um, this morning, what I wish to do is, is to briefly uh, trace an important part of the intellectual history, the intellectual lineage of modern traditional architecture. Now, of course, there are several ways to, to, to trace this intellectual lineage. One way would be to talk about continuity of traditional architecture throughout the 20th century, the fin de siècle, the radical classicism of the Enlightenment, or the integrative culture of the Renaissance. That's one way. A second way would be to adopt a comparative approach, showing how traditional architecture continued to be practiced even when modernist triumphalism claimed that traditional architecture should cease to be practiced. These are a few examples of traditional and modernist buildings that were built at the same time. So that's the second way of doing it. A third way, which is what I'll talk about mostly this morning, is to, to discuss the specific conditions that led to the emergence of traditional architecture largely as a reformatory response, an intellectual revolt against the devastation of nature and cities in the post-war years. That's what I wish to briefly trace this morning. But more precisely, what were and what are the intellectual strands, the intellectual strands that have logically led to the elaboration of modern traditional architecture. But before, before entering into the subject, I wish to make a couple of essential remarks, very important remarks. Uh, about how we link ideas and how we link forms. Um, it may sound a bit abstract, but if you bear with me for just a moment, if A came before B, A is not necessarily the cause of B. Um, and if A and B came at the same time or developed at the same time, they may influence each other, they may be sympathetic to each other, but they may proceed in different directions. I know it's very obvious, but it isn't so obvious to many architects and historians. For example, the fact that some postmodernists evinced a certain interest in traditional architectural forms does not necessarily make them the rightful antecedents of traditional architects. Similarly, the fact that some architects evinced interest in context, in collision, and in collage of urban forms does not necessarily make them the rightful antecedents of traditional architects. The fact that uh, postmodernism and context collision and collage, <coughs> the fact that they occurred at the same time as traditional architecture does not make them operative precedents to traditional architecture. Also, the fact that some architects and very, very few historians, the fact that some architects and few historians questioned and discredited the tenets of modernism does not make them supporters of traditional architecture. Some of the people in, in, represented here, Venturi and Rowe, were not protagonists of traditional architecture, although they would have tolerated it as an irritant to modernism. Some of the architects, some, some architects are very happy. They delight in residing in the middle, midway between traditional cultures and modernist culture while at once appreciating and condemning parts of each. So expressing sympathy towards some form of tradition or merely tolerating tradition does not lead to traditional architecture as if by necessity. What I have to do now is really trace some of the most important strands that led uh, uh, to the intellectual lineage of traditional architecture. In 1959, 
architect and historian Saverio Muratori published a very important study, a seminal study, concerning the, the urban evolution of Venice, Studi per una operante storia urbana di Venezia. The purpose of this 10-year study was to produce accurate plans of all of Venice's urban quarters, including the buildings, the streets, squares, or campi, and to provide assumptions regarding their development. Muratori combined socio-historical scholarship with an architectural typological analysis, hoping that his approach would provide a counterpoint to the positivist methods of planning cities. In studying the urban history of Venice, Muratori and his collaborators made three very important conclusions. One, architectural types find their embodiments within the urban fabric. Two, the urban fabric in turn has its embodiments in the whole urban form as a totality. Moratori called that the urban organism. And three, the total value of the urban organism is only understood through an understanding of historical continuity. Moratori's work showed that one of the gravest problems, one of the worst problems of contemporary cities derived in part from the consideration of buildings as objects that are isolated from the urban fabric. By contrast, his analyses of Venice and later his study for Rome showed that the structuralizing influence of urban form helped to modify building types and characters and anchor them to a place. Moratori's analyses uh, demonstrated that urban morphology and building typology dialectically transformed each other and reinforced each other. And this urban dialectic in Venice, or any city, could only have matured inside a certain urban continuity spanning many generations. But yet, this was precisely what modernist ideology had been trying to prevent in its emphasis on rupture and transgression of previous traditions, its replacement of the city by a multitude of object buildings inhabiting a ubiquitous undefined and uncontained space. Although Muratori's work put into direct comparison the lessons of Venice's long history, in contrast to the crises facing contemporary cities, it's also very important to note that he did not really directly propose that his methods should be turned into a strategy for present day building of cities. Nonetheless, while Muratori offered a gentle critique of the current teaching and practice of architecture. It is very significant that some of, his, some of his buildings were definitely moving in a traditional direction, as seen, for example, in his 1947 Chiesa Parrocchiale di San Giovanni al Catano in Pisa. Architects and historians who studied the rich history, the rich layers of, of traditional cities, are naturally compelled to identify with precision the urban and architectural conditions that assured some undeniable continuities, contributing to what people now call the sense of place or the sense for a place. One of these enduring elements is the concept of, of type, as was, and very curiously, was introduced in the early 1960s uh, into the architectural discourse by the art historian Giulio Carlo Argan and the Casabella Group in Milano. In part, their work was based on the concept of type as articulated by Quatremer de Quincy. Argan discussed type as a formal resemblance between a class of buildings that he called a root form. However, contrary to Quatremer's platonic understanding of type, Argan's typology is a deduction based on direct formal analogies. Quatremer made two important distinctions which were lost on most modernists. And these two distinctions are the type is distinguished from the model. The imitation is distinguished from the copy. But these distinctions are actually quite intimately linked. The type is an idea that serves as a rule for the model. And the, the model is a practical execution of a type. The imitation produces dissimilar buildings, that is, buildings that don't look alike. Imitation produces dissimilar buildings based on a common set of principles, while the copy, the copy means identical repetition. So the imitation and the copy are not the same. Argan uh, avoided Quatremer's fundamental distinctions between the type and the model and the imitation and, and the copy. 
in modernism, after all, in modernism, typology means the standard production of identical objects. And imitating is not distinguished from copying. Although Argan saw the use of type as necessary for historical classification, he believed that the uses of types was contrary to architectural invention. So it's very curious, indeed very strange, that as the concept of type was being reintroduced into the architectural discourse in the 1960s, it was simultaneously being condemned as an, as an obstacle to invention. To rectify, to fix, to repair this confusion was one of the tasks that would later be undertaken by traditional architects. Aldo Rossi appropriated Catromère de Quincy's concept of type, but his reading of type differed considerably from that of Argan. In his book, uh, his most important work, L'Architettura della Città, Rossi contributed to that most influential critique and reform of modernist uh, uh, architecture. The city, he argued, is a structure of urban artifacts, monuments, a system of streets and squares, and their relationship to topography. The city takes meaning from a deep historical rootedness maintained by collective memory, by formal analogy, and embodied in the idea of place. Building plans and building layouts, layouts of cities, they may change, but the idea of place persists for a very long time. Cities transform, yet urban continuity depended on certain permanences that transcended the function of buildings and their changes. changes. Types of such artifacts that persist as permanences woven within the urban fabric and connected with architectural character. Type, Rossi said, is, quote, that which approaches the most the essence of architecture. And despite changes, the most, it is always um, that which is evident to sentiment and to reason as the principle of architecture and the city, close quote. Rossi's use of the term permanences in the plural, permanence, we call them, permanences in the plural, serves to recall the rich multiplicity that underlied urban form in the past, a past that still meaningfully enhanced the life of daily, uh, daily life, in, in, at least in Italian cities. Rossi's attempt to reinstate collective memory embodied in the concepts of type, formal analogy, permanences, and monuments. Those attempts aimed at opposing the symbolic emptiness and the prevalent functionalist doctrines. More importantly, reinstating these concepts was intended to be operative or instrumental in the work of architects. In constructing his argument, Rossi drew on the work of architects, planners, historians, urban geographers, sociologists, and psychologists, and of course, the hauntingly evocative uh, imagery of the Capricci of Canaletto and Giorgio di Chirico. Most evocative of all was the deep humanism uh, that, that permeated still many Mediterranean cities. Now, under the thematic banner of rational architecture, with an implied relationship to the rationalism of the 1920s and 1930s, Rossi organized the 15th Triennale in Milano in 1973. And he exhibited the work of many architects from Europe, Japan, the United States, too numerous to, to, to mention here. For the conference catalog, Massimo Scolari wrote a very influential polemic, Avanguardia e Nuova Architettura. Scolari rejected functionalism, taking urban morphology and building typology as a basis for eliminating present errors, and striving toward an autonomy of architecture in the face of determining forces of commercialization. These are some of the, some of the tenets of a new direction proposed for what he called a refounding of architecture. And that refounding, Scolari called la tendenza, the tend tendency. And it's important to note, however, that notwithstanding his critical stance vis-a-vis -vis modernism, Scolari's call for a refounding of architecture was definitely rooted in modernism. In his opinion, in Scolari's opinion, modernism could be reformed by infusing it with humanist values futile attempt, perhaps. Two years after the, the, the 15th Triennale of Milano, Leon Crier organized a conference and exhibition in London and Barcelona titled Rational Architecture. 
which was followed in 1978 by his editing of an influential book carrying the same title. The architects included the Queer Brothers, Aldo Rossi, Massimo Scolari, Carlo Aimonino, Oswald Ungers, Bernard Rue, Miguel Garay, José Ignacio Lira Sassoro, François Chouari, uh, uh, Werner Kreis, Mario Botta, Giorgio Grassi, Shefik Birkier, and so on, many others. Now, the expression rational architecture, clarified, the expression rational architecture was not intended to revive the rationalismo of the 1920s, but rather the rebuilding of the public realm with a philosophical approach rooted in enlightenment rationalism in the order embodied in the European city. To rebuild the city and its architecture rationally required a decisive stand against modernism, against zoning practices, against the forced separation between all the elements that used to constitute a city's life. Urban morphology and building typology needed to, be, to become part of urban legislation in order to replace the abstract monofunctional zones that devastated the city. Not to be limited to formal questions alone, rational architecture must be conceived as part of, quote, an integral vision of society. It has to be part of an urban struggle, end of quote. The present detrimental building practices, which devastated both the city and the countryside with increasing in intensity since the Second World War, needed to be resolved through nothing short of what Creer called the reconstruction of the city. What rational architecture clearly demonstrated is that architects who had been espousing common formal and social beliefs had by then produced work of sufficient urban and architectural breadth that they could now present a reformative platform. Indeed, Creer's very organization of the book into thematic sections pointed to this breadth, the dialectics of urban morphology, the street, the square, the block, the quarter, the city within the city, and so on. Now, what connected the rationalists was the idea of an autonomous architecture. If the idea of nature, if the idea of nature validated classicism, and if the idea of the machine, or at least, essentially, if, if the machine validated modernism, the rationalists, by contrast, did not search for validation outside of architectural form <coughs> itself that is outside of architecture as a socio-historical cultural reality. Rather, the, the, the new rational architecture took its legitimation from the typologies of the city, from the accumulated urban wisdom that reached its optimal development in the 18th century, from the hierarchical distinction between the public and the private realms, and from urban space being formed by a continuous urban fabric. The new rationalists, rejected the modernist utopian reorganization of the city and society, the fragmentation of the city into zones and the isolated object building. Rational architecture was introduced by art historian Robert Delevoye, who directed the Institut Supérieur des Arts Décoratifs, which was housed in the old abbey of La Cambre in Brussels. Founded by Henri Van de Velde in 1927, the Institute had maintained a modernist curriculum in architecture and urbanism, painting, sculpture, as well as industrial design, until, until parts of the urban curriculum began to be changed toward the mid-70s under the influence of Maurice Culot and several other professors in cooperation. It's significant to note, it's very significant to note that this group realized the first attempt in the post-war era to elaborate a teaching that went in the direction of traditional architecture, based on the idea of reconstructing the European city. Many counter projects were proposed for the reconstruction of historic city centers, for working class districts, and for the re-urbanizing of industrial areas. The teaching at La Cambre strongly associated urbanism with visions of political justice and anti-industrial resistance. And as such, it was contrary to the general curriculum of La Cambre, as well as the political views of its faculty. In what amounted to be, to, to an academic uh, coup d'etat, Delevoye, Culot, and some of their colleagues were all removed from their teaching positions. La Cambre was subsequently closed as a school of architecture, although it still operates as an art school. <clears throat> 
Soon thereafter, the group opened the School of Architecture for the Reconstruction of the City, also in Brussels, with, with Delevoye as its president and more than 20 professors and 40 students. The school's statutes are very important uh, because they called for a reformative project uh, and research based on a socialist perspective with the purpose of, quote, contributing to a global project for a society that is radically different from the aims of an advanced industrialized society. To question the reigning system that organizes the built space and its modes of production. To recourse, to have recourse to a pedagogical project where reflection, analysis, and criticism and research are stimulated by profound, profound knowledge of the past while being accompanied with practical work. Most importantly, of course, was the connection, the close connection with citizens' associations. End of quote. Regrettably, the new school did not last. But under the direction of Maurice Culot and others, the Journal of the Archives d'Architecture Moderne continued to influence uh, and play uh, architectural circles and play a formative role in uh, traditional architecture well into the 1990s. The year 1978 was also an important year when it saw two important conferences take place, one in Palermo, one in Brussels. Both conferences drew attention to the current disarray of cities and architecture. And then five important points, five important points of these conferences I'd like to summarize here very briefly. One, the, devastation, the devastating effects on the city and the countryside by unbridled technological production operating under the guise of progress. Two, the reduction of cities to monofunctional zones leading to terribly wasteful territorial extensions. Three, the forced exodus of citizens out of the city and their forced daily mobilization back into the city. Four, the destruction of the artisanal culture and the transformation of architecture into a consumable production. And five, the transformation of architecture and the city into the experimental fields for the architect's personal idiosyncrasies. To remedy these problems, the conferees who included Léon Crier, Perugi Nicoline, Maurice Culot, Antoine Grombach, François Loyer, René Scambrot, Philippe Panorai, and others, the conferees presented a set of demands and offered solutions to the European economic community. The demands included the rights of citizens to repair the damage that was inflicted on their cities. A recommendation for all schools of architecture to orient their teaching toward the reparation of the European cities. Reconstructing the city could not happen through the abstractions of zoning, but rather through the integrate, integration of urban uh, life within quarters where mixed uses occurred in humanly scaled proximities. In criticizing postmodernism directly, the conferees emphasized that reconstructing the city must transcend the current stylistic experiments that were sometimes proposed as quotes and other times as alternative images to dominant modernist forms. The urgency to resolve urban problems could not be obtained by taking architectural forms from history, reducing them to their stylistic dimension alone, and then using them as a form of packaging, emballage. The consumer society made for milieu, where architectural culture comes to be consumed as a series of stylistic fragments. And while apologists for postmodernism applauded eclecticism as a sign of creativity, in reality, the process was usurped by the vast production of kitsch made inevitable by technological consumerism. It may surprise you, but this building, this is a building. Uh, uh, this building is for, it is in Ohio. It's uh, for a company that makes baskets. Um, if, if, kits, if kitsch as a deception and trivialization of artistic culture rapidly promises and rapidly fails to express any symbolic content, it is because much symbolic thought in architecture and in art had already collapsed. One has but to recall Charles Moore's intention in Piazza d'Italia, his project for the Italian community in New Orleans, to build what he calls, and I'm gonna quote, a delicatessen order, 
that he thought could resemble sausages hanging from a shop window, thus illustrating the transalpine location." End of quote. Understanding the causes for the collapse of symbolic forms, symbolic thought, was a necessary step in providing reformatory solutions. Two of the most notable causes were the separation of imitation from invention, followed by the confusion of artistic genre. Imitation in art and in architecture provides the intellectual discipline that enables the architect or artist to judiciously select and unify the best aspects of tradition, while invention, invention seeks to improve the rational choice made from tradition. With modernism, however, invention became an end in itself. Artistic and architectural production was now considered to be all invention. Imitation and invention thus came to be understood as antagonistic rather than complementary concepts. To be inventive meant that artists and architects were to make objects out of nothing, following the impulses of their individualistic expressionism. But, but artists and architects do not create in the elementary sense of creation from nothing, because their forms are invariably based on other forms, even if their forms are inversions or abstractions of other forms. Largely eclipsing the difference, the difference between the imitation and the copy, the empire of technological means gradually invaded all the arts and exploded the limits between the arts, between artistic genre. If the augmentation of technological means came at the expense of symbolic forms, it is important to note that the extreme proliferation of technological means aggressively brushed aside symbolic forms. The natural limits between the arts had been exploded. Thus, the distinction between an object of art made with artisanal skill and the multiplication of technological processes and products has been blurred. And here we encounter one of the, most, one of the greatest paradoxes of technological society. On one hand, the proliferation of objects means the triumph of the object. But on the other, the very proliferation also means the obsolescence of the object, a condition of no sense. To rectify such a collapse required the rehabilitation of, of imitation and invention as inseparable expressions of the human character. With that aim, with that purpose, Leon Crier and Dimitri Porfirios polemically reintroduced into the architectural discourse one of the classic texts on imitation, Catamère de Quincy's De l'Imitation, 1823. Central to Catamère's thought was that imitation produces the resemblance of an object within an other object that becomes its image. The imitation reveals one object within another. When applied to architecture, this imitative representation implies a distance between a general type and a particular model, object, or building. It affords the kind of intellectual pleasure that derives precisely from understanding this distance. Imitation is categorically distinguished from the copy, which, as we said before, it repeats the reality of an object. The copy implies repetition, sameness. It's the object's double. It's very double. Now, this prescient distinction made by Quatremer at a time when industrialization was beginning to, to displace objects of art was to obtain in full force with the technological production in series, with the collapse of types into the standard, and finally, with the collapse of the imitation into the copy. This is why, having rejected imitation, modernist theorists speak of simulacra. Reintroducing the concept of imitation in art and in architecture served to counteract certain theories of representation and their doubtful application to architecture. Largely as a reaction, as a reaction against the monistic practices of modernism, the postmodern cultural condition encouraged the coexistence of many architectural forms. And yet, notwithstanding this emancipatory role of postmodernism as a culture, it also engendered a certain relativism of values because it made reasoned judgment difficult, precisely because all forms were considered to be justifiable simply because they were made. 
Identifying postmodernism as yet another eclecticism, Dmitry Porfirios warned against the risks of what he called bathing in the pantheistic limbo of modern eclecticism. End of quote. An increase in eclecticism does not mean an increase in inventiveness. Modern traditional architects needed to be aware of the consumption of architectural forms, not only on the part of insidious advertising empires that caricaturize architecture, but also on the part of architects who are enthusiastic participants in this very consumption. Modern traditional architecture needed to avoid being absorbed into a world that re leveled the sense of place and hierarchical distinctions between private and public architectural expressions. The pluralistic range of modern traditional architecture needed to be founded on a clear distinction between the vernacular expression and the classical expression. Or as Porfirios put it, between the vernacular building craft and the art of the classical. Vernacular building craft refers to the propriety of forms and construction that answer the demands of the private realm, the house, the shop, the office. The art of the classical designates the propriety of forms and construction that respond to the demands of the public realm, the imitative ennobling and refining of the elements already present in vernacular architecture. If piers and beams answered the straightforward demands of buildings, classical tectonics transcend the contingencies of building in order to produce columnar orders and entablatures. By the middle to the late 1980s, the rationalists had articulated a comprehensive system aimed at reforming two interrelated institutions, two interrelated institutions, practice and the academy. As with all reformatory systems, the justification for proposed improvements is found in the very reasons underlying previous failures. And these failures resided precisely in practice and in the academy. First practice. And here I'm going to explain what traditional architects did as a response to present conditions. Against the reduction of the city into monofunctional zones, the rationalists reasserted the city's composition into quarters, streets, squares, and blocks. Against the segregation of urban components, the rationalists reaffirmed, the rationalists reaffirmed the dialectical relationship between the public and the private realms. Against the destruction of previously coherent systems, previously coherent quarters, and their replacement by alienating zones of high-rise buildings, the rationalists reinstated the value of urban density and the distribution of the public and the private buildings based on walkability. Against the discounting of buildings into a consumable and pollutive set of technological assemblies, they emphasized enduring building practices and materials. Against the collapse of architecture into technological standards, the rationalists reaffirmed architectural typology as an operative basis for practice. The typological is not the typical. Against the symbolic impoverishment of architectural character, the rationalists demonstrate, demonstrated the broad range of architectural expressions contained between the vernacular and the classical. Against rampant, rampant placelessness, the rationalists asserted the vital importance of regionalism and architectural character. More importantly, more importantly, the rationalists appealed to the world's architects that we can no longer gamble the lives of cities and perhaps the lives of the life of the planet itself on a technological milieu based on fossil fuel economies, a technological milieu that eclipsed and disrupted both nature and the city. Second point, the, the, the academy. Reconstructing the city for the rationalists passed through the reformation of architectural teaching, which in turn implied redressing the prevailing biases of architectural theory and architectural history. Against the prevailing belief that modernism was the exclusive form of modernity possible, the rationalists proved that tradition, modernity, and the new are perfectly complementary concepts that are always open to evolution and to reform. 
I guess the historicist narrative, and I'd like to briefly say what I mean by the word historicism, it's used in several meanings uh, nowadays. Uh, one use is to, make, to mean the use of historical forms. But historicism as an as a historical category, as an intellectual category, essentially means historical determinism. Hence the modernist argument that all of history led by one teleological strand into the apotheosis of modernism. That's historicism as a philosophy of history. So against the prevailing belief that modernism was the exclusive form of modernity possible, the rationalists proved that tradition, modernity, and the new were perfectly complementary concepts. Against the historicist narrative that claimed that history had one single direction that inexorably, inexorably led to the, to the apotheosis of modernism, the rationalists underlined the pitfalls, the pitfalls, the problems of historical determinism. Against the prevailing belief that the increase of technological means must necessarily lead to an increase in invention, the rationalists showed the contradiction inherent between technological determinism on one hand and artistic freedom on the other. Against their detractors, who accused them of repeating preferred architectural forms based on sentimental nostalgia, the rationalists insisted that their interest in the architecture of the past had little to do with its age value and much more to do with its exemplary architectural qualities. This reconstruction project not only continues to be elaborated, but it has since enjoyed breadth and intensification in the profession in academia. Now that there are numerous traditional architectural firms throughout the world, two schools of architecture, and several private institutes dedicated to traditional architecture, the Driehaus Prize, the Manzano Prize, and so on. However, however, if a handful of rationalists laid much of the theoretical foundations of modern traditional architecture, by the early to the middle 1980s, the rest of the profession remained mostly hostile, with the exception of some postmodernists, some contextualists, and some new urbanists, who shared with them certain formal affinities. One such affinity was an interest in the successful lessons of the past. And here, some of the commonalities also become reasons for divergences. The rationalist understanding of tradition concerns an evolving set of urban and architectural principles and their relation to regional character. The basis of their recuperation of tradition is the use of what has rationally been proven successful in the past and what might rationally prove successful under present conditions. For the rationalist tradition, traditions change, adapt, migrate, and the possibility for a new tradition to emerge is always present. This approach distinguishes the rationalists from revivalists who practice a traditional architecture with the understanding that tradition has already been fixed, completed, that it's done. So it's an important distinction between, to, to make between the new traditional architects and uh, uh, revivalist architects, though they have an enormous amount of uh, commonalities. By definition, traditional knowledge is rooted in reason. What is deservedly enduring in tradition. Traditional knowledge can ever be renewed, revised, and adapted to best suit present demands in view of dwelling enduringly within nature and within the city. To blindly repeat a tradition is an affront to reason. To blindly reject a tradition is also an affront to reason. The soundness of tradition derives from the soundness of reason. Continuity is judiciously approved when architectural production has rationally been proven successful. And change is carefully approved where and when there is a rational need to depart from a practice that has failed. Such is the rationality of traditional architecture as a modern practice. Following the hard-earned lessons since the Enlightenment. The practice of tradition stands to benefit from avoiding the belief in an unsurpassable and idealized past and avoiding the belief in an unknown idealized future. 
that will somehow emerge from a technologically determined reality. One last word about the uses of reason. The use of reason, even collective reason, is not a guarantee against mistakes. No one is rational enough to be wrong all the time. Consider the urban catastrophes that resulted from the rationality of modernism. Reason can make mistakes. It cannot always be vigilant, but, but it can always be reformed. And I can't resist but saying this last sentence in Spanish, forgive my pronunciation. La razón puede errar. No es que siempre puede estar vigilante. Sin, sin embargo, siempre puede ser reformada. Thank you. Thank you.